In the US, we spent the last 75 years or so building urban streets that pedestrians just can't cross. Well, today we're gonna to look at modern pedestrian crossing treatments, the completely absurd methodology traffic engineers use to decide where to build this kind of stuff. And we're gonna talk about some actual solutions and it's coming up next. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation. Viewer suggested topics always welcome and this is one I've been asked about a lot and this message from a patron is representative. I'd love to hear what you think about those flashing beacon lights at pedestrian bike crossings, RRFBs. The people selling them say they're cheap and effective, but I don't know about walking out in front of traffic just because there's a flashy light. There's more detail here, which I will touch on later in the video. So I'm going to be talking about some weird and sometimes infuriating stuff today, but let's just set a baseline by looking at a strode and talking about a couple of very typical crossing treatments. I'm not going to say a lot about these specific locations, but this first one is a six lane cross section with just a standard marked crosswalk. There isn't a button you can push to get a signal or anything. You just either have to wait around for a gap in traffic or hope someone yields at some point, which is not something I'd count on at this kind of location. So that's bad. An improvement on this would be what we call a median refuge island, where you can sprint past three lanes of traffic at a time, Frogger style, instead of trying to take all six lanes at once. Note that the place where you have to stand while you're waiting to even start crossing the street is a curb tight sidewalk right up against, yeah, this traffic is not going 35. Super fun when a bus blows by in the right lane, but at least you'll know where to go to talk to someone about your injury claim. Let's just pause for a second and recognize that school zones are in play here, and I do want to talk about that. So for like 20 minutes, twice a day on school days, some flashing lights come on, telling all the drivers to start driving like half the speed limit, which makes sense. If you're driving the prevailing speed, it's probably physically impossible for you to identify that a pedestrian is trying to cross and still have time to slow down and yield to them. So I get that, but what if I wanna cross the street outside those extremely limited school zone hours? Isn't the very existence of school speed zones basically a bald admission that crossing these streets is basically impossible? I'm just curious. So let's get into a couple ways cities are trying to improve this bad situation. And I'll start with the one that my patron asked about. And I'll just let the mayor of Albuquerque introduce this one. And this is one of four locations that have received these uh, rapid um, I, I forget the, the acronym is RRFB. I can't remember what that stands for, but these. Oh man, I have so much sympathy for our elected officials. It's like the planning and engineering professions are just custom designed to crank out these indecipherable acronyms. Anyway, it is a rectangular rapid flashing beacon, and I didn't actually film one in action because this is at a middle school and I don't want to put a bunch of unwitting middle schoolers in my video, but the way it works is you hit a button, the flashy lights start up, and theoretically cars stop so you can cross the street. So the research shows that RRFBs result in motorist yielding compliance of up to 98%, which sounds amazing until you realize that 2% of the time you just get run over by a car. The whole thing is actually wild if you think about it. It is pretty much the law in every state that motorists have to yield to pedestrians at all crosswalks. So we're talking about spending money, putting in infrastructure just to get people to drive legally. So our RFBs, for better or worse, are kind of a go-to for cities these days when they're looking for what we call an active or enhanced, or sometimes we call it a yellow treatment. So not a red stop signal, but just strong encouragement for drivers to do what they were legally required to do in the first place, which is to yield. So now let's talk about a red treatment that's somewhat commonly used in bicycle and pedestrian crossing situations, and that's a hawk. I won't make the Albuquerque mayor remember this one, but it's a high intensity activated crosswalk signal. It is a weird one. A person walking or biking activates it. It flashes yellow to give drivers advance warning. 
Then it goes to solid yellow, like a normal traffic signal, and then a double red. These aren't that common, so the drivers really have to be somewhere where they can read the fine print. It doesn't really work the same as other kinds of signals you see out on the road. So sort of confusing, which isn't really what you want out of a traffic control device. And they're expensive, but they do get traffic to stop eventually. Okay, so how do traffic engineers figure out where they're going to install this kind of stuff? Well, allow me to introduce you to National Cooperative Highway Research Program Report 562, Improving Pedestrian Safety at Unsignalized Crossings. The whole document is kind of fascinating and maddening, with a lot of research and extremely convoluted math, but it all culminates in a methodology and worksheet that, last I checked, are still the technical basis for most of these kinds of decisions. I'm just gonna step through their example analysis, which is a strode with a posted speed of 35 and no median refuge island. So step one is make sure we're using the worksheet that goes with the street characteristics, check. Step two is just kind of hilarious. You have to have a minimum of 20 pedestrians crossing in the peak hour to even meet the threshold to continue with the analysis at all. Which, it's amazing you can ever get 20 people crossing at an uncontrolled location on a strode in the first place. Like, the 50 they have in this example just seems like fantasy land. If you get to step three, they want you to check and see if you qualify for the pedestrian warrant for a full traffic signal under the usual signal warrant methodology. And for this one, you actually need 271 people crossing. It's just bananas stuff. That's not gonna work, so you go to step four where you do this extremely car brained thing of calculating and totaling up all the pedestrian delay as if the main issue you're trying to solve is increasing like the pedestrian LOS instead of just, you know, designing a place where people don't have to risk their lives just across the street. This one actually shows an average pedestrian delay of 707 seconds, which does lead you to wonder how they ever counted 50 people crossing the street there. Like, were people literally hanging out for 12 minutes waiting for a gap in traffic? And step five, after all this, it gives you a recommendation based on the total pedestrian delay and an assumption about local motorist yielding behavior. Anyway, in this example, it spits out an enhanced slash active treatment, which basically means an RRFB these days. There are just so many things going on here. I mean, the calculations involved basically make it clear that asking pedestrians to cross a five or seven lane street with 35 plus mile per hour traffic at an uncontrolled location is completely ridiculous. Yet, in a lot of the US, that's exactly how our transportation system is designed. A lot of traffic engineers just don't like installing features that encourage people to cross the street, because then, if a pedestrian gets hit, there might actually be a liability question. It's the whole crosswalks give a false sense of security mindset, and it's kind of a backwards and really corrosive way of thinking about our transportation system, but that's kind of where we're at. Okay, more to come, including what I think real solutions look like. But first, quick reminder to like and subscribe if you're a fan of the Byzantine nature of US traffic engineering and the extremely weird traffic control devices it comes up with. Connect on all the usual websites and consider becoming a patron if you want occasional bonus material and the deep sense of well-being you'll get from supporting my weekly nonsense directly. Okay, so I'm going to talk a bit about biking now, and I don't want to give the impression that this particular city isn't good for biking. It's okay, and with the climate and the topography, it has the potential to be much more. There are the beginnings of a good bike boulevard network, but some of the streets that should be included are just marked as bike routes without the cute purple signs or the 18 mile per hour speed limits or the hawk signals and other treatments you'd hope to find when you're crossing a seven lane strode. Like, how exactly am I supposed to get across this one? I finally ended up just doing it in two stages and hanging out on this median that's like two feet wide. Probably not advisable, but I'm just working with what the city's giving me. This one's even worse. The bikeway itself is fine, low traffic street, 
fresh paving job, smooth the ride, but how am I supposed to cross this street? Maybe this is the one that has an average pedestrian delay of 707 seconds, but that might be a low estimate. So here's a question. Is there any reason any city in the US needs any street that has seven lanes anywhere? I guarantee you, I can come out here at any time of the day and there will be nowhere near enough traffic to justify having seven lanes, usually not even five. And I know how this happens. If you project compound annual traffic growth of like one and a half percent, over the next 30 years, which is a requirement I've seen in some city's traffic analysis guidelines, well then yeah, you'd better just build your roads as wide as possible. Don't worry, induced traffic isn't real. Let's go back to another point made in the original comment. Not all cars stop, so if there's more than one lane of traffic, the pedestrian might get lucky on the first lane and not so lucky on the next one. Yeah, this is called a double threat situation, where someone crossing the street feels safe because the car in the first lane stopped, and, well, they aren't safe. Fortunately, it's illegal in this particular state for motorists to overtake and pass a car that's yielding to a pedestrian, so you can cross the street confidently with the peace of mind that after you get hit by that second car that's going 45 miles an hour, you can at least be certain they'll get like a moving violation or something. There are so many benefits to right-sizing our roadways and removing the double threat situation which comes up in so much of the pedestrian crash data is a big one. And the particular city I'm in does do some of this. This three-lane arterial with buffered bike lanes, not my favorite kind of bike infrastructure, but this is a huge improvement over what it was a few years ago when it was barely bikeable at all and even more dangerous to cross as a pedestrian. What all this comes down to is, so much of what we do in city planning and design is just self-fulfilling prophecies. If you design your transportation system as if no one is ever going to walk, then no one is ever going to walk, and you'll never be able to count a sufficient number of pedestrians to quote-unquote justify more people-friendly streets. So I just challenge city officials, planners, and engineers to think about all this just a little differently. Like, I've been a planner for a lot of my adult life, and I know it's a difficult job, and sometimes you have to balance competing interests. Like, the need for someone to be able to drive somewhere and have it take five minutes instead of like five minutes and 20 seconds, versus the need for someone to be able to walk to a bus stop without getting maimed. I'm just a YouTuber at this point though, so who am I to judge the relative importance of these things? And that's all I've got. Thanks for joining today, and thanks to the patrons for helping to fund this exploration of very typical American streets and crossing infrastructure. Not quite as inspirational as Montreal, but we can't all just live in cities that value vibrant human activity and have places where people can walk and bike without fearing for their lives. I mean, what kind of world would that be? Anyway, keep the great topic suggestions coming. I'll be back with a new installment next week, and I'll see you then.